One summer in college, I was chaperoning two different churches' youth camps in two different weeks of the summer. One was my home church, and another one was one I was working with in First Baptist Nashville as a summer intern. Two different weeks of camp, two different camp pastors, two different experiences entirely. In the first one, the camp pastor told a room full of hundreds of impressionable teenagers, listen, don't ever go to a bar. Nothing holy can be found in a bar. You can't find godliness where there is only godless people. The second preacher stood in front of hundreds of impressionable teenagers and said, if you don't take Jesus into a bar, who will? You need to go into a bar. You need to meet people so they can experience the love of Christ. Make disciples everywhere, including the bar. Which one's right? That's our challenge in Luke 5 today. We're jumping into another table scene, and we're seeing a character we don't normally talk about, Levi. He's a tax collector, and Jesus calls him to be a disciple. The scene opens with two sharply different groups, the Pharisees and the tax collectors. We need to talk about both, so let's start with the tax collectors. In first century Palestine, there were direct taxes that you had to pay. Poll taxes, land taxes, you were all taxed by tax collectors who took money for the Romans. They were employed by the Romans. But then there was another group of people where you had tolls and tariffs and customs fees. They were collected at toll houses, or as scripture calls them, a toll booth. Levi was a toll collector, not a tax collector. But honestly, the words are interchangeable. Dr. Pepper is a Coke. It's the same thing. The biggest difference, though, is a toll collector would pay the Romans in advance to set up a booth and to charge whatever they wanted. Now this is an important detail. Levi would pay the Romans for the right to set up a toll booth at the border or edge of the town. Every time people came in and out of the town, they were required to pay whatever Levi saw that fit for people to pay. He would inflate fees, causing all kinds of corruption. The toll collectors, they're often not natives of the town either, making them, due to their wealth and all of their collusion with the Romans, targets of scorn. So here's Levi, an outsider, a foreigner, working in tandem with the oppressive, occupying Roman regime. And he's who Jesus calls to be a disciple? He is scandalous. I mean, Levi has no qualifications, no virtue, no honor, no shame, no education, no pedigree, no reputation. It is in every sense of the word scandalous for a rabbi to call this man to follow. Now there's a second group in our scripture today, the Pharisees. We've talked at length about who they are during this sermon series, but just to reiterate, Pharisees are good people. They are probably pompous, but they're good people who are doing their best to be as acutely as possible pious. They live out their devotion to God by keeping the Torah, and they want to maintain purity at every sense of the word. So therefore, they stand apart. They don't get involved or even associate with toll collectors and tax collectors or really anyone who is participating in something that makes them unclean. They're too pious. They walk around trying to be examples of purity. Holding these two people groups in context will help you understand this story. Let's jump into it again in verse 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. This is such a scandal. 
I mean, holy moly, what is Jesus doing? He is aligning himself with the worst of the worst. I mean, this is the rift raft of the community, the most hated. These people are awful, and Jesus calls him to follow. And he, Levi, gets up, leaves everything, and follows Jesus. Now, we don't have time to explore this little nugget, but if I were to preach this sermon next week, I would focus in on verse 28, that Levi was called. And when he was called, he got up, left everything, and followed. He got up, left everything, and followed. This is the power that Jesus has on all of our lives. When we are called, we can't help but to get up to leave the old world behind and step forward into something new. But I'm not preaching that sermon. I'm preaching a different one. So back to the story. Verse 29. Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house. And there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at the table with them. The Pharisees and the scribes were complaining to the disciples, saying, Why does he eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? We'll pause here. One more detail about the Pharisees. The Torah guides their decisions, forces certain behaviors on them, especially when it comes to food and meal preparations. The Pharisees always maintained a separation from others, and they would only eat with themselves. They would never have sat down at a table to eat with people they saw as unclean. Their job was to observe the law of purity, which means they would have hated the fact that Jesus sits down at Levi's home. I mean, look how they describe the people that Jesus is associating with. They call all of them sinners. All of them. They just lump them all in together. They're all bad. Every single person Jesus is eating with at Levi's house, they're all corrupt. And embedded into this question that the Pharisees ask the disciples is the critique that Jesus is doing it all wrong. His ministry is wrong. By Jesus eating with the toll collectors and the sinners, he is making himself unclean. I mean, that's the Pharisees' argument. He is aligning himself with their sin. He is giving weight and acceptance to the impurities in which they find themselves. He is participating and honoring and affirming their lifestyle. It is scandalous. Now, the Pharisees would not have had any problems with Jesus if he would have taken a room full of toll collectors and sinners and rebuked them, call them out for the sinners in which they are, tell them they needed to repent and to turn of their wicked ways, and he won't step foot in their house until they do. If Jesus would have done that, The Pharisees would have adored him. They would have made him a religious icon in the community because only Jesus could have made the worst of the worst repent and turn of their ways. But instead, the Pharisees lose their minds when they see that instead of rebuking, Jesus associates with the sinners. He eats with the unclean. It is scandalous at every angle. Now you may be asking yourself, if the Pharisees are so against this moment, if they hate this dinner scene so much, what are they doing there? Why are they there? They're there to critique and to judge. In a Galilean village, a feast was a public affair. Even those not invited would come just to see who got invited, hence the presence of the Pharisees. They're standing outside of the courtyard, peering in through the fence. And what they see is that Levi's banquet is full of joy and celebration, 
which causes the Pharisees to lose their minds again because Jesus' presence is only validating the sin in front of us which sets up a very interesting dichotomy. Levi is absolutely hated by the socially elite, the Pharisees. He works for Rome. So who is it that he would invite and who would actually come to his party? And that's the Pharisees' point. It, to be honest, everyone there associates with something that is bad. And that's a strong point that the Pharisees have. It would be others who are pushed to the edges of society, others who are hated or are two-faced and have a bad reputation in the community, or others who, like Levi, were lining their pockets unfairly with the impoverished people of the community's hard-earned dollars. So why is Jesus there? That's a great question by the Pharisees. And our answer is because he is extending grace to even unto the least of these. He's calling even the least of these into a new life. But the Pharisees can't see it. They just complain. Why does he claim to be this Jewish rabbi and hold these master classes of education all the time if he's just going to go and do stunts like this? And then something subtle happens. The Pharisees direct their question to the disciples. But look who answers. Jesus does. Now the disciples must have been standing outside in the courtyard, whispering back and forth with the Pharisees too. And then Jesus hears them. And then he steps over into their little moment. And he responds. And he delivers a proverb. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now this proverb states the obvious. The sick need a physician. Those who are well, they don't need a doctor. But like with most things that Jesus says, there are layers here. Who exactly is the wealthy? Who exactly is the sick in this story? Now on the first reading, it's obvious. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, listen guys, calm down. These sinners over here, they need me. I'm helping, don't be against this. They're being healed from the wickedness in which they have lived and been about. They are about to repent. Just give me space to work. Quit being such naysayers. Now that's the first reading of the text and it's a good one. Rightfully so, we should see that this moment is happening. But look at it again. Verse 30. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Then Jesus answered, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus never actually says who's sick, who's the sinner, and who doesn't need to repent. Instead, he makes wise the simple. An easy, straightforward phrase is turned into a double-edged sword. Of course, Jesus is calling Levi out of his wickedness. And he says, Levi, come and follow me. I mean, after all, Levi is doing terrible things and Jesus calls him to a new way of life. But could Jesus also be calling the Pharisees to repent too? Honestly, either way you look at it, it works. And that's the beauty of the gospel. It has so many layers to how we can see the message of Christ in its stories. Jesus identifies with the tax collectors and sinners by joining their party. He doesn't rebuke them. He calls them out of their wickedness by associating with them. He helps move them into a life of discipleship by loving them, not hating them. He is completely okay with being at the party. He's not judging the toll collectors. 
but he's also identifying with the Pharisees too. He looks through the courtyard and he sees the Pharisees scouring at everyone. Instead of hating the Pharisees or judging them for their hypocrisy, he walks over and meets them in their pain too and says, you know, those who are well, pointing to the crowd, they need no physician, but you do. Your pious elitism is getting in the way of seeing the gospel, and you need to repent. It's an amazingly complex moment. Jesus is making wise the simple, adding layers of meaning just within this text. So who are the sinners here? Is it Levi or is it the Pharisees? Honestly, it's both. Remember the stories of the preachers saying you shouldn't go to the bar, you should go to the bar? Which one is right? They both are. That's the complexity of faith. There's not one right or wrong way to showcase your faith. But if your faith causes you to hate someone for who they are, then I guarantee you're getting faith wrong. Jesus doesn't want or wait for Levi or the Pharisees to become pure. He goes to them. In both cases, Jesus meets Levi and the Pharisees on their turf in their sin and calls them to a new way of living. He does the same for all of us. He steps into our mess. He comes to us and he calls us out into a new way of living. A healer goes to the sick, and that's what Jesus is doing in Luke 5, and even today for all of us. Jesus is telling all of us that discipleship doesn't lead you away from the outcasts. It leads you towards them. Repentance doesn't lead you into a life of isolation. It leads you into association. You don't get to disengage and then claim piety as if you're morally superior. It doesn't work that way. To follow Jesus is to go wherever Jesus goes and to go in love and in the name of Christ. It means associating with people in the love and in the name of Christ. It means loving every person in front of you with love and in the name of Christ. It means embracing every single person in this world as if they are an equal because they are, at least in love and in the name of Christ they are. What Jesus is doing here is scandalous. He is redefining discipleship for those who say, oh, my faith doesn't allow me to engage with those types of people. And yet, here's Jesus sitting and eating associating at every level. And through this engagement, he leads this party of misfits into a new life of discipleship. And it's the Pharisees and the scribes who are standing on the outside of the courtyard, who are peering through their own prison bars, wondering why Jesus could be so wrong and Jesus could come to them in all of their wickedness too. And yet that's the moment Jesus calls the Pharisees to repent as well. When I read this story, it makes me think of all the churches who too quickly judge the people who live in walking distance of the church. It's those same churches that vote to move out of their downtown setting so they can try and recruit more middle class and wealthier members, disassociating themselves with the downtown vibe of the city or with people that they don't classify themselves as the same socioeconomic status. If anything, those churches are doing nothing but exemplifying hypocrisy and superiority. It's what the Pharisees are doing too. It also makes me think of why non-Christians say most Christians are hypocritical. It's us Christians who look with judgment on the sins of others, while in our own self-titled piety, we pretend that our discipleship grants us the freedom 
to exclude and separate whenever we want and however we want. We can judge, we can demean. God's given us the ability to cast those we don't like into the margins. But that is not what Jesus does in Luke 5. If our faith causes us to hate someone, we are doing faith wrong. No one could have been more drastically illustrated this point than Levi. He is a terrible human being, and yet Christ made room for even him, and we should too. To do this, though, we have to come out of our own piety to see others as Christ sees them in all of their potential, in all of their deservedness to be loved by the God who created them. True discipleship follows the love of Christ everywhere. Levi knew this. The Pharisees now know this. And we should too.